not the guy to be dancing. So, hey, folks, I think we're live. We live, Marcus? I think so. All right, let me look at my Facebook page. How about you, Michael? Are we live? Live on YouTube. All right, that sounds good. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Elk Talk Live, our QA session. I think we're on episode 11 or 12. Not sure. Uh, but. We've had so many people participating in this. It's crazy how many people were watching live last week. Uh, you think about all the companies that are supporting us, and it's Botec, Leupold, uh, Tight Spot Quivers, Ripcord Aero Rest, Black Gold Sights. And this week, joining us now is one of my uh, partners in all the other things I do is OnX, uh, the mapping system that either for your smartphone or your desktop. Now the whole thing is all one package. Uh, they're with us. So all you watching on the OnX pages. One of the things we want to talk about, normally we grab a few questions from the prior week. This week we want to talk about uh, a system that I use for finding elk on public land. And the reason I'm going to start with that is you're going to see out on the Botech pages, uh, their Facebook page, I think starting next Tuesday it is, they're going to start uh, showing a bunch of videos we have, and it's what I call my system. It's the system for finding elk on public land. And I'll, I'll do the overview. And the overview says that if you are looking for elk on public land, you need to know what time of year you're hunting them, because that's going to determine what needs they have. And the needs they have determine where you're going to find them because they are going to go wherever they can satisfy that need. And it's really similar to fishing. If you fish bass or walleyes or any uh, reservoir, lake type fish that moves with the seasons, in the early spring, what's their need? Spawning. So where are they? They're up shallow in the warm water. So in the spring, that's where you're going to fish them. You're not going to fish out deep. And then when they have a need for food and cooler water, they go out deep and so you fish deep. Now, if you fished shallow in August, just because you caught them up there in April, guess what? There are no fish there in April or in August. They're all out deep. Same thing applies for elk hunting. We have five calendar periods in which we hunt elk. We have the early season, which is anytime I say in August. We have the pre-rut, which for me, I usually say is about September 1st to the 10th. Then we have the peak rut, which is September 10th-ish, 15th-ish, somewhere in there, to probably the 5th to the 8th of October. And then we start getting into the post-rut period, which is usually you know, October 8th, 10th to the end of October. And then November, December, anything after November 1st for me is late season. We have four basic needs for elk. They need food, water, obviously. They need sanctuary and security, and they, need, they have a temporary seasonal need of breeding, just like fish have spawning as a, a seasonal or temporary need. So you need to know what season you're hunting. Is it, okay, I'm hunting post-rut. All right, what's their primary need in post-rut? Is it breeding? No, the rut's over. Is it food? Yeah, to some degree. Is it water? Yeah, to some degree but it's really sanctuary. So you gotta go to the places where they're gonna hide. Now in the pre-rut, their primary need is food, water, and breeding is getting up there. So you're gonna go to the places, these bulls are gonna be staging near where the cows are because the primary need is breeding. So it's a system that's based on how do you know where to find elk? Well, you kind of reverse engineer that and say, what period of the year, what calendar period am I hunting them? That tells me what their needs are, whether it's food, water, sanctuary, or breeding, and in what priority they have those needs, because they're going to go, and that's where you're going to find them. They're going to go where they can satisfy their highest need with the least amount of risk and danger. I know that sounds really simple. So a lot of the questions that we get asked on this are, when I answer them, they're built around that system. And starting next Tuesday, Botech's going to start adding uh, these videos. We've done all kinds of videos about this system. And they're out on our YouTube channel. We're going to be doing some new ones to freshen it up with this stuff that we're doing here. So that's kind of the, 
the intro of today's episode. And we have Marcus running the camera today, and we have Michael reading the questions. And what do you got for a first question, Michael? How does logging, or how does active logging affect elk hunting? How does active logging affect elk hunting? Uh, while the skitters and the, the fallers and everything are there during elk season, yeah, it's gonna displace the elk. Now, if it's thinning or clear cutting, give it a year and come back and the canopy's now been, open, been opened, you're gonna find grass about this tall and you're gonna find elk in there feeding and then they feed in the morning and they go to the adjacent thicker timber where it's cooler or safer and they're gonna bed there in the late morning, stay there till late afternoon and come and feed again. So in a lot of instances, if, if it's not overly roaded, if the roads gets closed after the logging, clear cuts and thinning areas can be really, really helpful. In fact, uh, the new Onyx map layer, one of the layers for all US Forest Service lands, it will tell you where it's been thinned or clear cut and what year it was done. Because some places, maybe it was cut in 2002 and it's already growing up so much that maybe it's not as good as a place that was thinned in 2013. So it will displace them temporarily, but usually for years thereafter, it can Im actually improve the habitat for elk. So what's next? Hey Randy, have you been putting in for elk hunts in Utah or have you considered coming and doing general archery again? Uh, I didn't, I, I've been, I applied in Utah. I never did the general archery elk. Um, that elk tag that I drew in 2014, and you'll see it out on our YouTube channel, that was in the South Cache limited entry archery unit. So I'm now on the waiting list. I think I've, what is it in Utah? Five years or 10 years? I gotta wait until I can apply again. So uh, if I'm gonna do general hunts or over the counter hunts, I'm probably gonna do them in Montana, Idaho, or Colorado. And some people ask me, well, why, why do you focus on those three states? Uh, for me, those three states, Montana, Idaho, and Colorado, they're over the counter or general hunts, uh, leftover hunts are better than probably any of the other states. So that's why I focus there. Uh, any advice for taking care of velvet ant antlers after the shot? Any advice for taking care of velvet antlers after the shot? Uh, uh, ask your taxidermist is my first advice because you can really damage the velvet easily. Very seldom are we hunting them. I mean, some of the early seasons in Utah and Nevada those are probably the earliest seasons I know of. They start in August. You might have velvet bowls. Most of the rest of the places that when season opens, the velvet's been rubbed. I would take it to a taxidermist immediately, keep it cool, keep the flies off it. And some, will, some taxidermists will say, inject it with formaldehyde. Uh, I don't wanna carry a bunch of formaldehyde and a, an injection needle with me. So uh, I've never had the problem because I never shot a bull in the velvet. How far will bulls move from a rut area in late season? Season? Do they just move to remote, a remote area close to the rut area? How far will a bull elk move from the peak rut to the late season? Will they just move to an area nearby? Uh, it depends, but in most instances, once the rut is over, the cows usually stay in that general area because the food is still really good there and the bulls disperse, and they will disperse miles away, many miles away. And they're going back into the country where they know hunters don't wanna go. So if you look at that calendar period, like I was explaining earlier, you're migrating or transitioning from the peak rut to post rut. And I always say that post rut is the hardest time of any period to kill a, bubble, a public land bull elk. And the reason is, they leave the cows and they push back either way up high, way far away, places where there aren't roads or trails, or down in canyons. And they're really, <laughs> really tucked in there and they're hard to find. They don't come out until that last little bit in the evening and they don't stay out very long in the morning. So they will travel a pretty long ways from where they've been rutting. What clothing will you wear while bow hunting this September? What clothing will I wear while bow hunting this September? Everybody knows that I'm fond of the Sitka gear uh, this year. 
in the early season, like we'll be archery mule deer hunting in Nevada here shortly. I'll be wearing their Ascent series. It's a very uh, lightweight, made for hot, hot weather, dries really quickly. I'll be using that. When you get into September, if it's still one of those really hot September hunts, I might stick with that for a while. But from that, then I'm going to usually go to the mountain pant and uh, then I'll layer up. Is that lightning or we got a jet coming in? Are the Koreans coming? What's the deal? I think we got North Korean air flying over here. Uh, sorry, folks. Usually we don't have jets at my house. But uh, well, in later September, I'm going to be wearing the mountain pant, which is a heavier pant, has a well, DWR, a water repellent layer on it. And then I'm just about always going to layer up, starting with, uh, I showed it last week, the merino wool layer, the zip T long sleeve merino wool layer. And I'll just layer on top based on how, you know, in the mountain you might have a chill in the morning, and then I can layer off as the activity or the temperature causes me to change. Do you have any tips for over-the-counter archery antelope? Tips for over-the-counter archery antelope? Almost impossible. I don't know of any. I think Colorado might have a few units that are uh, open for uh, over-the-counter archery antelope, but uh, I, man, I... I don't know of any, to be honest with you. I, uh, I think he pretty much got to apply everywhere. There's a, but there are over-the-counter archery elk places. Colorado and Idaho still have tags available. So what else we got? I'm, uh, I'm trying to keep up with questions here. I'm going to have to leave that up to you guys because they're coming in so fast. I can't read them all. How do you uh, care for meat once you get it back to the truck? How do I care for meat once I get it back to the truck? So we've shot an elk and we've boned it or quartered it, whatever, it, and that's a whole different discussion. We now have it back to the truck. When I get it back to the truck, if that's where my camp is, I'm gonna hang it overnight, I'm gonna let the wind blow on it, I'm gonna keep it in the shade, I'm gonna let that temperature get really, really low. The lowest temperature is probably gonna be at about five or six in the morning. I'm also going to let, make sure my coolers are cold at that time. I'm going to open them, and for me to fit full elk quarters in a cooler, you got to have the bone out of it. So by that time, I probably have boned it out, and I've let the meat cool thoroughly all the way through. I put it in the cooler. I put as much ice on top because cold air sinks. You don't want the ice on the bottom. You want the ice on the top. And then I'm going to seal that thing up, I'm going to cover it, I'm going to keep it in shade, and I'm getting to wherever, whether it's home, whether it's a professional meat processor, take care of it that way. Uh, do bull elk still stay in these sanctuary areas all winter and summer? Do bull elk stay in sanctuaries all winter and all summer? No, they don't. Bull elk go to sanctuary areas to avoid hunting pressure. As quick as hunting season's over, you will see them start moving towards the winter rangers. And a lot of times the winter rangers are very open, very accessible. And they will stay there till they drop their antlers. They'll start following the green line, the snow line, back up the mountain. If it's in the southwest, sometimes it'll be the reverse. They'll go down into the canyons as sanctuary and then they'll come back out once hunting pressure is over. So, no, they use sanctuary only to avoid hunting pressure. Once hunting seasons are over, within a week or two, they're a lot more visible and they're moving to wherever their winter range is. Do you think elk are evolving from increased year-to-year -year hunting pressure? Do I think elk are evolving from increased year-to-year -year hunting pressure? I don't know. <laughs> that would, you'd have to ask someone a lot smarter than me about that question. Uh, I, I really don't. It'd just be speculation and opinion. I'm good at giving opinions, but I don't want to give an opinion on something scientific, so. How do you approach areas that you can't glass and are just steep and thick? How do I approach areas that you can't glass that are steep and just too thick to glass? I usually don't approach them. I usually go find an area that I can glass. I know some units, it's, there are no places where you can glass because it is so thick. Uh, I try to not hunt those areas. I try to find breaks in the terrain. Uh, an avalanche shoot, an old burn, uh, maybe where the beetle kill has killed all the needles off the pines and, or the evergreens and you can look in there. 
Uh, I'm looking for places where this big canopy that blocks out all the sunlight and keeps vegetation from growing, I'm looking for the areas where the canopy has been broken or disturbed because that's going to allow sunlight to penetrate. That's where the grasses are going to, going to grow and elk are grazers and they're going to be there feeding somewhere nearby. Have you ever hunted coastal black-tailed deer or have plans to do so? Have I ever hunted coastal black-tailed deer and do I have plans to do so? Uh, I have in Alaska, if you want to call Sitka blacktails coastal deer. I've never hunted them in Washington, Oregon, or California. Uh, I do plan to someday. So, How many pounds of meat do you get from an average bull elk? How many pounds of meat from an average bull elk? Boy, I've heard this all over the map. I've heard so many stories about this. Uh, if you trim it up really good, and it's a very mature bull elk, I'm talking like six, seven, eight, nine year old bull elk, I'm usually going to get in the high 200s. Uh, some people will say, oh no, I got 400 pounds of elk or meat off that elk. If you did, good. I've, I've never had that. Um, you know, it just, it depends on the size, obviously. What time of year are they post rut? Or is it late season where they're just completely emaciated from the rut? Uh, I've had people tell me on a younger raghorn bull elk, they only got 120, 140 pounds of meat. So, I, again, a lot of these questions, I know I say it depends, but it depends. How can I bring an elk back, uh, an elk head back? to California from out of state because of strict regulations. Yeah, this person's asking, how do I bring an elk head back from out of state because of all these state regulations? Most of these state regulations do not allow the interstate uh, transfer or, or uh, transportation of elk heads or other spinal fluid because of chronic wasting disease. CWD lives in the brain and the spinal fluids. So most states, say you cannot bring an elk from Colorado into Nebraska or into Utah or you can't bring an elk from Nevada into Arizona. So usually you have to do your own uh, uh, Euro mount there and get the skull clean or you have to leave it with the taxidermist or you cut the skull cap off and all you have is the head with the skull cap. You don't have the whole head, you don't have any spinal uh, tissue. Uh, what's the number one thing to look for in a sanctuary area? Number one thing to look for in a sanctuary area? Uh, it's, <laughs> gosh, I hate saying it depends. All right, most of the places I hunt in the mountains, the number one thing that's going to create a sanctuary area is the terrain. Most people don't want to hike up or hike down. Uh, last week we had a Colorado elk hunt on TV. We just loaded it up on our YouTube channel this week and you will see that's a sanctuary area. It is extreme topography with bedding areas, with feeding areas in the broken parts of that topography. Normally I would say topography creates a sanctuary more so than distance. Uh, for, this guy says, first off, I love what you do, Randy. Thank you. I've always uh, dreamed of of hunting elk. I've inherited my grandfather's hunting rifles and shotguns, one of which is a uh, Finnish Seiko 7mm. Yep. Uh, is that good enough for hunting elk? Sure. Okay. The person uh, inherited their father's 7mm, and the question is, or grandfather's, is that good enough for elk? Yeah. The number of elk killed with a 7mm with a high quality bullet is immense. It is a terrific elk round. Just make sure you have a really well constructed bullet. And I, I kind of go to one of three bullets. Everyone knows I use Nosler. I'm either going with a partition, an Acubon, or an E-tip. Is kind of my gig. So, you know the cool part right now is it is what August 9th. I think that I'm trying to remember. I think in about just not very long. Nevada's archery elk season opens, uh, Utah's archery elk season opens in about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Colorado and Idaho open uh, September 2nd, I think, Montana's open. September 1st, archery in uh, uh, Wyoming and New Mexico open. It's not long, folks, and we are going to be out there bow in hand chasing elk. 
How cool is that? And Michael, Michael's running two phones right now. This guy, he's got it going. What do we got? Uh, hi, Randy. How do you care for your hunting clothes, i.e. washing? How do I care for my hunting clothes when I'm washing? Uh, I wash them. I have some non-UV uh, detergent. When I'm out in the field, I have a little wash basin, and I wash. I have two sets of everything. I wash them one day or the second day or third day, and I put on the, the other ones. Wear those for two or three days, and then I take the ones that I've washed. I just wash them with water and a low UV soap or a non-UV uh, detergent and go, go with that. I, I know a lot of people think that, oh, I got to do all this spray down stuff and I got to be like whitetail conscious with scent. You can't hunt elk in the mountains on public land like we do and think you're going to stay scent free. It's too exerting. You're going to be sweating. If you wear any of those kind of clothing layers that have whatever charcoal or I don't know what it is, and you exert yourself the way we do, you're going to die. <laughs> you are going to sweat to death. So you just have to get really good at playing the wind. Even if you, if you think you don't have to play the wind and that these scent products are going to make up for you, no. It's not. If you get upwind from an elk, even with all that stuff, your breath, your hair, your whatever, they're going to smell it and they're gone. So I don't even worry about it. I know you like to hunt burns for elk. Would you also hunt burns for mule deer and other big game species? Yes. Uh, the question is, I know, Randy, you love to hunt burns for elk. Would you hunt it for mule deer and other big game species? Yes. Last year I killed a whitetail and a burn. I don't know how many mule deer we've killed in burns. Uh, I think we shot four mule deer last year and all four of them were in burns or past, their, you know, old, old burns. One really fresh burn. Uh, I've shot antelope in burns, uh, birds. Burns are just, if you think about it, the whole West evolved as a fire prone landscape. We have disrupted that by suppressing fire for the last hundred years. We've really altered the natural habitats that animals in, in the West relied upon. They evolved going to burns, feeding on the most nutritious regrowth that comes from burns. That's why I hunt there. I don't care what the species is, I'm going to hunt there. And the new app from Onyx Maps has a layer. You just click it and say, old burns. It'll show this, like, I don't know what you call it, a polygon of some sort. And it'll do it by color. It'll tell you what year the burn was. I almost wish they didn't have that layer in there because now I'm going to run into a lot more people in these burns. But, oh well. A um, 165 grain bullet or a 180 grain bullet? And I'm assuming they're talking about elk hunting. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends on what you're shooting. Like, I shoot a 308. I've used 165s and 180s. I've used 150s. For a 30 caliber, I'd always use 165 or above. Uh, find out what your rifle likes the best. Some rifles will like a heavier bullet, some barrels. Even You might have the same exact model of rifle, but in one of them, it likes 180 grains. In the same exact rifle, same barrel length, same everything, likes 165 grains. Go out and shoot and find out what your rifle likes the most. But for elk, the general rule is the bigger slash heavier the bullet in terms of grains, the more effective it will be on elk. And just make sure it's a high quality bullet. Um, what's your average pack out weight for meat? So oh, I'm going to ask Marcus that. Marcus, what's our average pack out weight? 80 pounds? I think it all depends on how many people are with us. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a good good point. Marcus says it. I asked Marcus because he's been on many packouts with us. He said, well, that depends on how many loads we want to get it out in, how much other weight we have with us because we have camera gear, production gear, spotting scopes, tripods. Uh, for me, anymore, I, I've given up on the 100, 110 pound packs. I'm more of a 70, 75 pound guy. Just my knees, my ankles, my legs. I would rather make one extra trip and make reasonable trips. And you see, I use trekking poles all the time. When you are fully loaded, it's, it's unbelievable how valuable those trekking poles are.
to take that weight off your your body from the hips on down. Um, what do you use to wrap your meat while packing out? Uh, game bags. Uh, I've talked about them before. I don't. Oh, I have one right here. Just a second. I don't wrap it when I'm packing out per se. These are game bags. I put everything in these synthetic game bags. These ones are made by Caribou Gear Company. Uh, I don't get paid a dime for talking about them. They're just the best game bags I've found. And uh, the beauty of them is they're synthetic, so they wick moisture really quickly, even if it rains. With quick as it stops raining, that moisture's going. They're reusable. They're super strong. Um, what are your top three scouting objectives when hunting or learning a new area? My top three scouting objectives when hunting or learning a new area. Uh, I want to know where the roads are because, and trails because that's going to tell me where the hunting pressure is going to come from. And then I also want to know how are the places or where are the routes that I can get to places I can be glassing from. And, and, and I'm talking about normally rifle hunting. If I'm bow hunting, I'm trying to get where are the places I can go without as much other hunting pressure and be doing my calling in the morning before the sun comes up. So I'm scouting looking for where am I going to kind of have my own place, assuming there's the other things <coughs> they need, food, water, uh, stuff like that. <coughs> I'm good. As my grandma would say, I need a cigarette. I don't smoke. <coughs> Bless her soul. <laughs> I recently heard flying into landlocked state land in Montana is now illegal. Is this true? I, it used to be you couldn't hunt uh, the day you flew. All right. Uh, it's, uh, the question is, I've heard that you can now fly into landlocked state land in Montana. No, that you can't. They, I recently heard that they, flying into state land is now legal in Montana. Now legal or illegal? Illegal. Oh, illegal. Uh, that's not my understanding. Well, let me back up. You really ha have, and you've seen us do it many times. There's five episodes out on our YouTube channel where we've flown in with a helicopter to landlocked land. You cannot do it on Forest Service. You can do it on BLM. And most of the state land people, the little blue sections who you talk to, will say you cannot do it on state land. So that usually just leaves BLM. And whatever, wherever you do it, whether you find a way to do it on state land or on BLM, you do have to wait until the next day before you can hunt. Is two months too early to hunt a burn? Is two months too early to hunt a burn? No, not if it has rained since the burn. So right now they're having the monsoon season down in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, a little bit of Colorado and Utah. And if you had a burn that happened in, let's say, July, and now that monsoon moisture is coming by September, there's going to be these little green shoots. And it might, be, <laughs> it might be that spot everyone else overlooks that you will find out. It depends on how hot that burn was, how large of an area it burned. Uh, but it's not too early, but normally my experience is it's much better the next year. Are you going to be doing another hunt with your son this year? Am I going to be doing another hunt with my son this year? Yes, I am. He drew a moose tag here in Montana. I've never drawn a moose tag in 27 tries here in Montana, but he drew one this year. So we'll be doing that hunt together. How long will the elk, elk rut last compared to whitetail rut? How long will the elk rut last compared to the whitetail rut? Um, I hear all kinds of different stories about the whitetail rut. Oh, it's only 10 days, whatever. I've seen elk start rutting and chasing cows September 1st. I have shot bull elk. In fact, there's one of them on the wall right there. I shot on Halloween, and he was chasing a young, I think it was a yearling cow, and he was going crazy. So what's that, two months? I've seen elk rutting happen over a two-month period, all of September, all of October. How much time before sunrise do you plan on getting into your elk areas? How much time before sunrise do I plan on getting into my elk area? Well, usually in most states, you can hunt a half hour before sunrise is, is legal shooting light. So obviously I back up that half hour. I want to be to my glassing spot well before legal shooting light. I want to be there. I want to get set up. I want to get organized. I want to let the place quiet down. I want to just listen. 
So a lot of times I'm there at least a half hour, maybe 45 minutes before legal shooting light. And yeah, you're really good navigating with a headlamp. That's, that you have to be. If you aren't comfortable hiking in in the dark or hiking out in the dark, your odds of being a public land elk hunter just went way down. What's your go-to fluid when you're needing an energy boost? I'm talking, my, I think he's talking about like something. My go-to fluid when I need an energy boost? Uh, you guys are going to laugh. I'll go grab it here. Uh, I'm not really big on supplements. <clears throat> Most of you know that I have a liver condition where I got to be really careful with what I eat or drink or put in my body. Uh, there's a company called Squincher. Uh, they're based somewhere in the south, I think Mississippi or Alabama. And here's some electrolyte powders. Uh, they come in these, they call them a quick stick. Uh, you just put that in there, a bunch of electrolytes. And then if I'm hiking out and I'm feeling kind of down, uh, they make these energy bursts things don't eat too many of them I had a camera guy eat about three bags of these in one session I thought we we're gonna have to <laughs> call the, <laughs> the chopper to get him out man he was spazzing out so uh, that that's what I use um, can you explain thermals in the morning versus the evening please can you explain thermals in the morning versus the evening all right we know heavy air or cold air is heavier When's the air the coldest? In the morning, so it's going downhill. As quick as the sun comes up, the slopes that the sun hits first, it warms them up, warm air rises. So starting mid-morning, you're going to have the shaded slopes where it's still going downhill, and you're going to have the sunny slopes where it's going uphill. And then you're going to get, until it gets really constant, so let's say from mid-morning to noon, you're going to have a mix of everything. Then by noon, when the sun is at its arc and the whole landscape's heated up, you're going to have a consistent upwind thermal. And then as the sun starts dropping and slopes start getting shaded in the evening, again, it's cooling. So those shaded slopes, you're going to start having a downward thermal. Hope that answers it. Uh, in, uh, in Utah, the rifle elk hunt opens the second week of October this year. Would you hunt this as post rut or the rut? I would hunt that. Oh, someone asked if you in Utah when you're in the second week of October when the uh, rifle elk season opens this year, would you hunt that as rut or post rut? I'd probably hunt it more as post rut than I would as rut. So, uh, one thing I forgot to mention before we jumped right into this is uh, we're going to start doing some giveaways here, and you're going to want to be signed up for those. Uh, I can't tell you what it is until September. Or maybe I can tell them this month. I'm waiting to get permission to tell you. Uh, but to do that, you want to text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. And for those of you who somehow got my cell phone number, don't text my cell phone number with Randy. That doesn't count. I, I, every time I say this, the, the next morning I wake up, I've got like 100 texts. Randy, 313131. No. Go and do a Google search of how you text somebody <laughs> for, for one of these notifications. Go in there and text and put in Randy and the number is 313131. Or in Canada, 393939. You're going to be entered in all these drawings, all these contests, and you're going to get notified whenever we go live because next week we're trying to do this live from a mountain somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be. But next week is it. It is like, all right, we're getting rid of the net. We're walking the high wire, no safety net. So, all right, I'm getting the flash here that we're, we're just about getting close to the end. What do we got? Um, we got to have a good archery one. Someone's got to ask something archery, about my bow, don't they? There's an archery one. All right. Uh, what kind of groups do you demand? Out, uh, what type of groups do you demand out of your arch or your bow before hunting? What type of groups do I demand out of my bow before hunting? Well, I don't really demand it out of my bow. I demand it out of myself. Because I can assure you that this bow right here, this Rain 7, with this black gold sight, tight spot quiver, and this ripcord rest with really good arrows and good broadheads is not any part of, I would say, it's not the weak link in the equation. 
I'm the weak link. So what do I demand of myself for groups? Uh, out, my range is just out here to our left, and I usually practice 50 and in. And at 50 yards, I expect a four-inch group. If I can't get a four-inch group at 50 yards, well, guess what? There's no way I'm shooting at 50 yards. So I keep moving myself in until I know I'm at those tighter groups. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, I want a one-inch group, or ah, oh, an eight-inch group is fine. I guess it's up to each person. For me, I hold it to, I better be able to do four-inch groups consistently. Um, I've heard elk can't see uh, red or green light. Do you know anything about this? I've, the person said, I've heard elk can't see red or green light. Do I know anything about that? I've heard the same thing. And that's why you will see when we're walking in at night, we have uh, headlamps that have a red filter or a green filter. Because if you talk to a lot of the people who study the vision of ungulates with the rods and cones that those have, they say that red and green light is hard for those animals to see. So I've heard the same thing, and that's what I do. I, I can't, I'm not the scientist who've done the studies, so I can't say for sure. But we got a Leupold question in there. feels like we're kind of leaving the good folks at Leupold out of the question. Uh, there was, a, was there one? There was one. It was very, it was kind of complicated. But it was, it I was think it was explaining, trying to compare the old versions of Leupold scopes to the new ones. Uh, uh, old version of their rifle scopes to the new like ones? The, yeah, the VX versus the Variax. Oh, the old Variax versus the new VX. So Leupold used to be called Variax 2 or Variax 3. Now it's VX. Uh, what it is is just you, over time you keep improving technology and improving and improving. And right now the VX3i, the VX5, and the VX6, if you can find a better scope w from start to finish, from how it performs, from the warranty, to the CDS dials, to the coatings. Uh, tell me where it is, because I want to see that. If I, I would t tell anybody, take a scope. If you're buying a scope, go to the sporting goods store. But don't just look in the store. Take it outside and look into the sun, where you've got direct sun rays coming your direction. And then you're going to see the difference in a high quality piece of glass with great coatings, with great engineering that knows how to handle glare. And compare that to the other one where maybe it's the, the guy behind the counter. And I hate to disappoint a bunch of you people, but a lot of these lower end optics companies tell the guy behind the counter, hey, we'll give you 20 bucks if you push our rifle scope. That's why you get talked into one of the other rifle scopes. And they don't want you to take them outside and do some actual tests. Take them outside. Put the same price Leupold against any other scope. You will end up buying the Leupold. And it's just because of the technology. So, All right, Michael. Are, are we going to get thrown off the air here? Botech going to just cut it? We got a little battery. Oh, we got a low battery, so if the battery dies, I guess we're done, right? <laughs> Can you explain, explain your aiming uh, with the bow when shooting uphill or downhill? Do you aim higher or lower when you're shooting uphill? Okay, so the person saying when you aim uphill or downhill, where do you aim? Well, for me, I use a Leupold TBR rangefinder. TBR means true ballistic range. So this is a quick lesson in uh, trigonometry. So if you're up here and the deer is down here or the elk is down here, this hypotenuse here is, to, is called line of sight from where you're standing to where the animal is. Well, gravity only works on the hor horizontal distance. It doesn't care what the line of sight is. So I would suggest you get a high quality rangefinder that has that built in and it tells you here's your angle Here's the line of sight distance. So it does the trigonometry for you and says, hold at 32 yards, even though the line of sight might be 48. So that's, a, that's the easy answer to it. If you, uh, uh, most people end up shooting over because they don't have something like that and they range it and the line of sight is 48 yards. So they hold for 48. Well, gravity only works on your arrow for these 32 yards. So you shoot way over it. And the same if you're going the other direction. So people have a tendency to shoot over when they're shooting uphill or downhill. What is your Last one. What is your favorite uh, loophole product that they make? 
uh, what do you rely on the most, uh, rifle scope or spotting scope? Of all the Leupold products, what do I rely on the most, my spotting scope or my rifle scope? Well, it's a two-party question. Okay. Um, I would say that I probably rely on my rifle scope more than anything. And, and I'll kind of explain to you how I use optics. You see, I always have binos in a harness. My binos are what I live with. I mean, that's where I'm locating items. If it's something far away, I need a really good, you know, really inspect it, uh, I'll grab this. This is my 80 millimeter gold ring Leupold spotter. And if I dial this thing up to the maximum 60 power, I'm going to be able to see something. But it's heavy, so a lot of times, any of us, you know, when we're carrying uh, big spotters, we say, huh, might leave that at the truck. So I have a smaller 60 millimeter spotter, which is like the greatest lightweight uh, spotter I know of. So that's how I end up using it. But when it comes to crunch time, for me, I click my range finder. It says, oh, that's 212 yards. I spin my CDS dial on my scope. Leupold makes these CDS dials called custom dial system. I spin that to 212 yards and it automatically adjusts my point of impact for the distance. So I'd probably say my rifle scope is the most critical part of that optics equation in rifle hunting. So is that it, Michael? All right, Marcus, we got a battery. Oh, it says we got like 30 seconds of battery left, folks, so I'm going to talk really fast. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Bowtech, thanks to Ripcord, thanks to Leupold, thanks to Tight Spot, Black Gold, and to Onyx Maps. Thanks for you to you for watching. Stay tuned. Remember, text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131 in Canada, 393939, and you're going to be glad you did because we're going to start giving away some really cool stuff and one really big cool thing. Thanks for watching. Are we done?